Hi everybody, my name is Mark Tennant and I'm delighted to be joining you from the UK for the USPTA Florida Division Virtual Conference 2021. Of course, I'd rather be with you in person at a conference in the beautiful Florida sun, uh, presenting to you on court on this subject today, but uh, with the year that we've all had, uh, I guess we're lucky to be able to share uh, ideas in a virtual sense at all. So, um, it's my privilege to be able to talk to you today around connecting the surf to the rest of the game. Just before we get into some of the content of today, um, I just want to give you a little bit of background to why I've decided to talk around this subject. And in my capacity as director of our company in the UK, Inspire to Coach, um, I spend a lot of time on court, not just with coaches in the UK, but also around the world. We do a lot of work with tennis federations, tennis academies, tennis programs to help coaches uh, to develop their skills and to make the most of their coaching practice to help their players be the best they can be. And so I just want to share with you some thoughts on an area where I find that we are consistently missing opportunities to be more effective or more to the point to help our players to be more effective in what they do in their serving practice. Just to give you a little bit of context and a few outline thoughts before we get into the detail, um, it depends obviously on the study that you read, but let's work on the basis that the average length of a point in pro tennis is round about four shots. It could be a little bit more, could be a little bit less, depending on a whole range of factors, but it's going to be round about four shots. So on that basis, 50% of the game is the serve and the return. Or if we look at it from the server's point of view, 50% of the game is the serve plus ball three. If we use some stats from this year's Australian Open, and in particular from Rafael Nadal, we know that he hit a forehand immediately after his serve 77% of the time, and he won 65% of those plays. So we know it's a very typical um, play in, in professional tennis. But I want to make the point to you today that it's equally possible for juniors and for our club adults to play uh, similar patterns and to be able to play in such a way that they can actually make the most of the serve that they have. And it's my experience that a lot of the time when coaches are practicing the serve with their players or working on the serve with their players, we're missing big opportunities to help our players not just to serve better, but more importantly, to serve more effectively. So this is not about um, the technique on the serve as such today. I'm not going to be talking a lot about grips and about all the biomechanics of, of the serve. That's for another presentation for another day. But even with a fairly basic level serve, a club standard serve with a forehand grip, where it's more of a fast push rather than a, a throwing action, we can still be effective with the serve and we can still use the serve to create opportunities and advantage for ball three. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. So I would question how much we actually make our serving practice effective. And I would question whether we actually make the most of the limited time that we often have with our players to help them to really understand what it means to be effective with the serve. So this is the first of a, um, a number of little videos that I'm going to show you today. This one, is, it's not great quality, it's just filmed on my iPhone. And this is from um, one of our coach education programs that we're running in Finland. This little boy is five years old, so I'm just gonna play the very short clip and then I want to make a few points around what's going on in the video. So, apart from the fact that he's a totally cute little kid, um, he's actually got quite a nice rhythm developing uh, for a five-year-old. Of course, we could have a look at that and be critical about the grip and about his balance and all those things, but the kid's five years old, so we have to give him a little bit of uh, 
<laughs> little bit of credit for, 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 for having pretty good rhythm developing on that serve. But my issue is not about the serve itself, it's more about the practice. And I believe that practices like this happen all the time, all around the world. I've seen a lot of it, and I believe that a lot of you listening today will recognize practices like that from your own coaching or perhaps from those of other teaching pros in your club and, and in other clubs and academies around you. And I believe that that's the tennis equivalent of the golf driving range. I'm sure a lot of you play golf and a lot of you will go to the golf driving range on a regular basis. And because there is no hole to aim for, because you don't have bunkers and water to avoid, you don't have to keep the ball on a narrow fairway, the golf driving range becomes a very technical activity. And I believe that that's where we go wrong with the serve. The serve very quickly becomes a less interesting and a more technical exercise because we don't add enough tactical purpose to the serve to make it anything else. It becomes a lot of repet repetitive serving, quite often with the teaching pro standing next to the player and giving all sorts of information which we believe is important and I'm sure is important, but I question how much the players are actually taking away. And I would also question whether we have enough tactical value in a lot of our serving practice to make it something that the players can then implement in match play. Because we all know that working on the practice court and what we do in matches is very different. And we all recognize the frustration where we might be working on a particular thing in practice only to watch our kids in the match. And none of that things that we've, we've worked on in practice is in evidence in the match. And that's because they haven't really learned it or they haven't really learned the true value of it. And of course, match play is meaningful. There are points at stake. And therefore, I'm reluctant to try new things when I want to try to win my match. So we need to try and make sure that there is real high tactical value to what we do when we do serving practices and that it doesn't become a less interesting and a more technical exercise. I believe that there are some big missed opportunities and I'm going to talk to you today about what those missed opportunities are and what we can do to perhaps correct them so that we can get more um, more out of our serving practice. I believe that there are missed opportunities in this video on the intensity. So for example, as soon as the boy has hit the serve, he switches off. We wouldn't expect him to react in the same way in match play because there is no need for a physical response because the ball is not coming back to him from an opponent. He's not having to prepare from ball three. So in terms of the practice, the intensity is not great and the physical response is poor. And as a result of that, the quality of the serving practice is not optimal. I believe that with a few very simple adaptations, we could rapidly increase the quality of the serving practice to make it more uh, suitable uh, for the match play court. And finally, it's just not what happens in a game. What happens when we are serving uh, on, in an individual lesson, in a in a one to one lesson, for example, is that the player will hit the ball and then they will probably turn around for you to throw them another ball so that they can have another serve. And it's just so far removed from what happens in a tennis match that I would question a lot of the value of that practice. And more importantly, I would question whether it's actually helping the players to really understand how to use their serve in an effective way. So just with a very simple adaptation, you can see me in this photo here with a, a, a 10 year old, nine year old boy, beg your pardon. Um, there are some very simple things that we can do, and I want to unwrap this a little bit more as we go through the presentation. But just simply asking our player to become ready for the third shot after they've hit their serve is immediately going to add value to the practice. So it could be that as soon as they've hit that serve, you ask them to land and balance as if they're ready and shaping up for ball three. It could be that you ask them to land and catch a ball that you've tossed to them from a position where I am in that photo. 
or it could be that you get them to land after the serve and then you get them to hit ball three as they would in match play. And I want to just unpack that a little bit more as we go through today and just show you some very simple ideas on how that can happen. Here's another short video. Again, the quality is not very good, um, but um, I think there's actually a lot of value in this video. This again is from Finland. Uh, there's quite a lot of background noise, but the important thing is that you see what is actually happening in this exercise. And just before I play the video, and the, these kids are very, very young, they're at what we call the blue stage in Europe. So this is pre 36 foot court or pre red stage, okay? So these kids are, are really at the beginning of their tennis journey and they're playing with like a, a large, uh, like a, what you would call a soccer ball, uh, a light soccer ball uh, type size. Um, so that they can throw and catch with two hands. And if you have a look at the bottom of the screen here, you can see um, four dots that have been put along the baseline. And the idea of this game is that the kids are immediately starting to think about how they start the point by throwing the ball into space. It's not a natural thing for children to do, to find space and then to throw the ball into that space. That already requires tactical understanding. So the idea is that the child at this end, nearest the camera, is going to be the server as such, and that he is going to stand at one of those four dots. And the key thing is that there is no middle dot. So he can stand wide left or wide right, or he can stand closer to the center left or right, but he cannot stand in the middle. So naturally, there is an angle created, which then is going to create space. I'll let the video play and then we'll break it down a little bit afterwards. So he chooses where he wants to stand, deciding which spot he wants to stand at. So there we go, he decides to go wide left. And with a lot of excitement as comes back and all five. So I started off by talking about Rafael Nadal, but in 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 a sense, we're seeing exactly the same here. We're seeing the serve creating an advantage, and then we're seeing the next shot, ball three, being thrown into the open court. And that's so much of what tennis is about when we're looking at serving patterns. And already here at three and four years old, we're already starting to develop that mentality that actually, if we understand where we can throw the ball and where there are spaces, we can start to create advantages or we can start to create the idea of attack and defense. So connecting the serve with the rest of the game can start at a very, very early age. Okay, so so often, as I've already said, the serve is practiced in isolation, especially in individual lessons. It's you, the teaching pro, with your player, often at the same end, at the same baseline, and the player is often serving into an empty court. Now, sure, you may put some targets down or something like that, but the practice doesn't stop with just um, hitting the serve at a target and then turning around and getting an next ball and then repeating that action. There's more we can do with that. And as I've just shown in this video here, Already we can start at a very young age with very simple uh, drills. We can start to connect the serve with the rest of the game. So I believe that we are all guilty, me, all of us, I would suggest guilty on a regular basis of 
practicing poor practice of regular repetition of poor practice missing opportunities where we could just do a little bit more if we created more of a, a mindset of helping players to understand the value of an effective serve to help them to play um, the next shot to uh, either create the advantage or to finish the point. Practices involving serving into empty boxes are very common. I'm sure you recognize that and perhaps you like me in the past have also been uh, perhaps guilty of doing that. And that's where I would suggest that there are some of these missed opportunities. And so when you don't have a returner, there is no feedback. The greatest way to get feedback on the effectiveness of your serve is to have somebody down the far end of the court to return that ball. But if it's an individual lesson, maybe that's not possible. Maybe the teaching pro goes to the far end to be the returner, but sometimes as the pro, we like to be next to our server to be able to give them information. Maybe you're fortunate enough to be able to bring in a hitter to be the returner so that you can be at the same end of the court as your server. But again, that often isn't the case. And so we need to find other ways in which we can challenge the server to be ready to play an effective third shot after the serve. As I've already mentioned with the first of the little videos from Finland, when there's no return, there's no physical response. When there's no ball coming back, it's natural for us to switch off, to turn around, to face the pro, to get another ball from the trolley. And then to keep repeating that is essentially repeating the opposite of what happens in match play. If there's no return, there's no technical demand after the serve. There's no challenge on the player to land and be balanced. There's no challenge on the player from a technical and a tactical point of view to move up the court for a weak return from the mid court or to have to push back or wide depending on the, the depth or the width or the angle of the return that's coming in. And there's no mental response. We're not having players who are having to hunt down ball three, who are not having to stay um, aggressive after the serve to be able to finish the point on the third shot. None of that is easily created, I would suggest, by having a server just serving into an empty box. But there are some simple things that we can do. And Here's one example now. Again, this is the third and final video from Finland. Again, a little boy here. And just have a look at the simple red stage or 36 foot stage. One example of how we can already just get the players to be a little bit more switched on to what happens straight after the stage. <laughs> You've got to love the enthusiasm of these kids, haven't you? The important thing, again, is not to dissect the technique on the serve. These kids are very young, but the important thing is that they already are starting to understand through this program that the serve is not in isolation. The serve is not an isolated shot. The serve is a way to start the point, but to start the point in a way where we can create an advantage. But we don't know if the advantage has been created until we start to regularly play ball three and we get to see where the spaces are and how easy it is to play that ball three to then again press on the attack or to finish the point. So what we had there was the coach just kneeling in front of the player to toss in the ball for him to be able to um, play the next shot after the serve. And that keeps him focused from a technical point of view. It keeps him focused tactically, physically and mentally as well. Very simple adaptations, but that can give us a lot more um, outcome and a lot more value and benefit from a simple serving practice. Remember as well that players are going to play a lot more ground strokes than serves. So unless the serve is well developed, it's typical that the returner is going to have the advantage, especially on the second serve. So if we think about some typical uh, club players who uh, perhaps have relatively weak serves, or if we think about uh, kids playing matches in the 60-foot uh, the court, the orange dot court, it's quite common that the serve is relatively weak, not just technically, but tactically. I would suggest that that comes from a lot of the practice that they may have had, where the work has been done on the technical aspect of the serve, but perhaps not so much on the tactical value of the serve. 
So I believe that we have a duty as coaches to make sure that the serve is sufficiently well developed to make sure that when it's your turn to serve, that they're not serving at a disadvantage. And that disadvantage is even more great when we're talking about the second serve. But of course, it's not just about serving well, it's also about being ready and knowing what to do after that serve, because it is likely that the ball's gonna come back and therefore we have to prepare our players to be ready for whatever comes back from the returner. And of course, it's not always gonna be the case that they're gonna be able to attack on ball three. It may be that they have to go into more of a neutral rally situation on ball three, or that they may have to defend on ball three, depending on the quality of the, the serve and then the return that comes from that as well. So I believe that we have to practice three things. We have to practice creating trouble. In other words, using the serve to create an advantage. We have to practice staying out of trouble. That means serving in a way that doesn't give the advantage to the returner. And thirdly, we have to practice getting out of trouble. That means that we may serve in a way that isn't particularly effective, where the returner initially gets the advantage and we are forced as the server into a more defensive situation. So I would talk with my players on a regular basis from a young age about those three things, creating trouble, staying out of trouble and getting out of trouble. And I believe that those three things underpin what the serve is tactically all about. Here are two examples from uh, one of our partner clubs in Massachusetts. Um, again, very, very typical and simple serving practice. And again, the purpose of these videos is not to dissect the serve from a technical point of view. We would be here for a long time if we wanted to do that. And that's for another day, perhaps with another presentation. But the point here is just to see how in a very, very simple practice, we can adapt it so that the players don't switch off as soon as they've hit the, the serve. Remember, the typical serving practice involves either of these ladies hitting the serve and then immediately turning around to get themselves another ball so they can hit another serve. It's extremely simple, but I believe it's quite effective for the purpose of what we're discussing today. So the simple fact that after her serve, she's got to go and trap the ball or bounce the ball with her racket means that there is a physical response after the serve. There is a sort of a, a technical response of sorts in the sense that she's having to move into the court because she has to judge the depth or the speed of the incoming ball. So there is a receiving skill element. Tactically as well, she's having to move in if the ball is a little bit shorter. If it was a deeper return, she'd have to move back to trap the ball. And then that means that mentally she stays engaged rather than switching off straight after her serve. And to this lady as well, you'll see similar. So again, although she struggled to trap the ball or to, to catch the ball uh, with the hand and the racket there, again, we have a tactical response. So she has to move out wide after her serve because that's where the return was going. We have uh, a technical response in the sense that she was having to move her feet to get from her serving position out wide to where the return was going. Physically, again, we have the movement and she's staying engaged physically after the serve. And because of all of those things, she's not switching off mentally after the serve. She's staying engaged for a little bit longer in that practice. So these things are extremely simple, but I believe are extremely valuable in helping the players not view the serve either as a technical exercise only, although of course we know that the technique on the serve is, is very important. And secondly, that we help them to understand that actually there is something that has to happen after they've hit that serve. And I just don't believe that enough of our serving practice takes into account those two factors that I've just made. So I want to just 
uh, break this down a little bit more now to look at what we call the performance factors. Um, you may or may not be familiar with the, the four performance factors. In other words, to look at the tactical dimension of the game, the technical dimensions, the physical dimensions, and the mental dimensions. And I think there are a number of reasons why, if we do a little bit more with our serving practice, as I'm suggesting, that we can really get some tactical, technical, physical, and mental benefits very simply by adapting our practice. So from a tactical point of view, as I've already said, I believe that it creates readiness after the serve. If the players know the return is coming back and they have to somehow deal with that return, either by catching it or by pushing it back or by hitting it back, then they are going to stay tactically ready. They're going to have to start making decisions. Where should I move after my serve? Where is the return going? Am I going short? Am I going into the court? Am I having to go back because the return is sending me deep behind the baseline? Am I having to go left or right because the ball's gone down the line or the ball has gone cross court? We have decisions to make. It could be that the ball is slow and has enough height for the player to then think that they can play an attacking shot on ball three. It may be that the decision is that they're going to have to retreat and they're going to have to play a higher ball back. So there is a lot of decision making that can come from just adding in ball three to a serving practice. We can start to look for what I call the serve and finish mentality. If I can serve effectively, and that doesn't mean that we have to have the best technical serve in the world, it just means that I can serve and move the opponent out wide, for example, or perhaps I can serve as a right hander down the middle to the tee to the opponent's backhand. So I can start to serve with a purpose, and that means that I can start to expect more weaker returns so that I can start to develop a serve and finish on ball three mentality. Equally, I also, as a player, have to have a serve and defend mentality. And I believe that a lot of coaches don't spend enough time on the defense. We spend a lot of time helping our players not to miss and to get more balls over the net and into the court. And we help our players to attack quite a lot. I question how much we teach our players and help our players to learn how to defend. But if we don't have a serve that's particularly effective, or perhaps it's a second serve, which is a lot weaker, then it is quite probable that the returners will have the advantage. Remember the point I made earlier that we hit a lot more ground strokes than we do serves in our tennis career. So it's little wonder that at clubs that our, um, our players have stronger ground strokes and especially stronger forehands than they do, uh, than they do the serve. So we have to practice the serve, but we also have to expect that serving isn't always an advantage. And therefore, we have to prepare our players to be able to serve and defend as well. From a technical point of view, there is a whole lot of value there in addressing ball three in our serving practice. We've got to look at the movement. So how does the player move up the court after the serve? How does the player move back after the serve? How do the players move left or right after the serve? All of those things require technical ability to be able then to attack or rally or to defend on ball three. We may well have a grip change. It may be that our players are serving with a forehand grip and then that they're not going to change the grip a whole lot on the forehand. They may change the grip for the backhand. It may be that they serve with a continental grip and then they're going to change to some kind of forehand grip. So it's... Um, there's a lot of value there in challenging the players to change the grip after the serve if necessary. And then we've got different contact points. So if we think about the contact point for the serve, clearly it's above the head. And then we have the next contact points, which are going to be shoulder height at best, perhaps a little bit lower, perhaps a little bit lower still down to the knees. So anywhere perhaps between head or shoulder height on that, that, that ball three and perhaps in more emergency situations, knee height or even perhaps a little bit lower. So there's a whole range of variations there between the contact point on the serve and then the contact point on ball three, depending on what type of return they have to deal with. From a physical point of view, and that's linked to the last point I've just made about the contact point, kids especially have to get used to different actions. And to be able to switch quickly from one action to another, it's a key element of coordination. 
So are kids able to adapt quickly from an over the shoulder to an under the shoulder uh, routine or, or movement? That's a very important part of coordination to be able to adapt quickly. Are they able to be um, to adapt between a throw and a swing? So if the serve is a throwing action and the forehand is a swinging action, those are completely different actions. They require different skills and therefore we have to learn to combine them um, in, in an effective way. And similarly, if the players have a dynamic serve, then they're going to have to work on landing and regaining balance before they then push off and move in any direction to deal with ball three. So by putting ball three into play or to ask the players, the servers to deal with ball three, we're putting quite a lot of physical demand on that practice just simply by asking them to hit ball three more often. And then from a mental point of view, there's the whole idea of planning and playing. So here's a question for you. How often do you think your players have a plan in mind before they serve? They pick up the ball, they come to the baseline, they steady themselves, perhaps they address the grip, they get themselves balanced. Do they have a plan of where they're going to serve and why? And do they have a plan based on that, on where they think that the return may come back and therefore what type of response physically, tactically, technically they're going to need in order to move to play ball three? I would suggest that a lot of players hit and hope, but they don't serve with a plan. And therefore, if we're going to throw in ball three, we have a great opportunity there to get the players to plan where they want to serve and why. Can I serve out wide, open up the court, create the advantage, plan to move in and finish on ball three? That's a great play. We talked about it with Rafael Nadal right at the beginning. It could be that we serve to the backhand, no angles, possibly a weaker return, ball down the middle. Is there the opportunity for the player to land, perhaps move around the ball, create an inside out forehand opportunity? All of that comes from having a very simple plan for the serve. I also think it's very important for juniors to understand in tennis that they're not going to have everything their own way all of the time. So whereas with the serve, you start with the ball and the racket in your hand, it's the only time in the game when you do, and therefore theoretically you are in total control, you're then very quickly into a situation where your opponent is now having, to, uh, having the opportunity to control what you do. Now, if the serve is really good and is putting the returner under a lot of pressure, then they're going to have very limited control. But if it's a weak second serve, for example, then the returner has a lot more control and therefore the server is going to be under pressure and has to deal with that mentally and emotionally. So there's a lot of benefits to making sure that in some shape or form, that regular serving practice includes having ball three to play. Whether it's getting the players to serve and then catch the ball, whether it's getting the players to serve and then hit the ball, it doesn't matter. The important thing is that the players stay engaged straight after the serve so that we then are working on the tactical, the physical and the mental response and not allowing the serve to just become a technical discipline as is so often the case. So now I'm going to show you a longer video. It's about six minutes long. And this is a video that I took a few years ago in England with uh, an orange ball player. And I think the serve uh, video here that I'm about to show you is pretty self-explanatory. So I'm going to go quiet for the next six minutes while you listen and watch. And I'll pick up on a few points um, uh, at the end. I've made the point already in this film and in the Red Court um, serve film as well that um, the serve along with the return are the most important shots in the game. And I think players recognise that, I think we as coaches recognise that. But it's ironic that whilst we say that and whilst we believe that, our actions on court don't actually mirror that. And it's quite typical, I think, that the serve tends to get left a little bit to an isolated close practice at the end of the lesson. 
And, and sometimes, sometimes we wonder, I think, why the ground strokes are so much more developed in match play than the serve. Quite, quite often it's typical that the serve on the orange court as well as on the red court are maybe six months, nine, maybe even 12 months behind in their development compared to the ground strokes. And, and there are simple reasons for that, and I genuinely believe we just do not practice the serve enough. So let me just tongue-in-cheek give you an example of what I suspect is quite a common occurrence. And, and if, if you're guilty, guilty of doing, doing the same thing, thing, let me first of all say that, that I've, I've done it too. It too. So, so I'm not trying to paint a picture here where I'm perfect and you're not. I think this is just a genuine sort of illustration of what tends to happen quite often in tennis lessons around the world. So, Harry, I'd like you to serve, please, from the right court. Off you go. So I'm watching Harry serving here and I'd be throwing out various technical points. But the key thing here is that this is an isolated practice on the serve. So if you watch what Harry does, whilst he might be trying quite hard to address some of those technical points, continue Harry, is that as soon as he's hit his serve, he turns away from the court and he starts to look back at me. So what we're not doing is training what happens immediately after the serve. I'm not keeping him that sharp here. In fact, I'm actually, in its worst cases, I'm actually training the wrong things because you might see a player hitting the serve and then actually turning round to either receive a ball from me, the coach, or to get one from the basket. So we're not training what happens in match play. So at this time, Harry, I'd like you to do it one more time, but I'd like you to get yourself ready as if you're about to play a ground stroke. Are you ready? That's, That's good. good. And, and now, now you can, can turn around, around and you can get another ball from me. But quite, quite often we create that situation because we are positioned behind our player with the basket. basket. So, so I'm going to show you an alternative solution here, which will help Harry to serve with the technical point that we might choose to be working on, but also to connect that serve with the ground strokes. And, and there's no reason why, whenever Harry is starting a rally, why he couldn't serve. And that in itself would mean that Harry would get an awful lot more serving practice than if we just left the serve to the last few minutes of the lesson. So the aim of this simple drill here is to allow Harry to be able to follow his serve with the right reaction so that he can then shape up for the ground stroke. So I'm gonna start off positioning myself inside the court you might think it's slightly dangerous, but I'm slightly off to the side, so we're okay. And he's going to hit the serve, we're going to ask for him to hit a wide serve, so a building serve, which would then result in him potentially getting a slightly weaker return. And I'm going to ask him, just for my own safety's sake, to be able to hit the return back the same way as the serve, as if he was hitting the third shot back behind where the return has just come from. Are you ready, Harry? Okay, so off you go with your serve. Okay, and, and again, again. So make, make sure, sure you get yourself, yourself nice and steady, nice and, steady, and ready. Let's, Let's just move this ball out of the way here. Are you, Are you ready? ready? Okay, okay, here we, we go. go. Now, in another, in another film, film, we might be working on ground strokes on the orange court. And one of the things I'd be impressing upon you there is the importance on the orange court of being able to develop higher contact points. By now, most of the players are probably using a semi-western grip, which will allow them to meet the ball that little bit higher. And if he's able to hit a building serve out wide here, then it makes sense that he's able then to come up the court and take the ball that little bit earlier to deny time to the opponent. So, so if we, we were working on the ground stroke element of this drill, I'd be wanting Harry to make sure that he takes the ball at chest height or even shoulder height to be able to take advantage of the opening that he's created. On another, another serve, it might be that actually the return pushes him into a more defensive situation. Take the ball, Harry. So this time I'm going to feed the ball to you and it's going to force you back into a more defensive situation. So I might even feed the ball behind the baseline. So you're going to have to come out of your serve, get ready, get balanced, move back to play your ground stroke. Are you ready? Off we go. And then back into the court. Okay, let's do it one more time. Let's remember to recover after you've played your forehand. Okay, so you'll move back, 
play, play the, the defensive, defensive forehand, forehand then, then move, move back, back in. in. And, and back, back in, in you come. come. Good, Good boy. boy. So, so we, we can, can use the hand, hand feed in this situation as a way of connecting the serve with the rest of the, ga uh, of the, of the game, game, of the ground strokes. And I think sometimes that doesn't happen enough. I see, I see a lot of serving in isolation, isolation and it might have a technical purpose, purpose but I fear sometimes that we might be missing the key goal of the serve, which is to then be able to try and capitalise on a building serve by hitting an aggressive ground stroke afterwards. It, it might on occasions be that we have to practice defensive ground strokes after the serve. And I think that's something else we don't practice enough a lot of the time. It's important for kids to be able to learn to defend. So here, with this hand feed, we can pretty much simulate whichever situation we want with the return. Whether it's a weaker short ball for Harry to attack, or whether it's a more offensive return where Harry has to back away from the baseline. I think that video was fairly self-explanatory and has uh, gone through a few of the points that I've already made earlier in this presentation. Um, but hopefully you were able to see there how simple it is to make some quite effective adaptations um, to help players to connect um, the serve with the rest of the game and to stay engaged physically, mentally and tactically, as well as having the technical um, things that they might be working on with their surf.
I just wanted to talk about one uh, key point there with Harry in particular, and you'll recognise this with some of your players, juniors and adults, and it's something that happens in particular towards uh, late orange uh, or into green level tennis. So uh, in our language, orange, uh, in your language, perhaps the 60 foot court and then going on to the full court with the green dot ball. And that's when the serve changes from being a, f a back foot through serve to being a front foot land serve. And if you notice in the picture on the left here, Harry is landing now on his left foot because he's got enough rotation and leg drive that means that he's just starting to twitch and to leave the ground a little bit which means that his right hip is not now swinging through for him to land on he's now landing on his left foot that means that if you look at the second picture he's momentarily very vulnerable from a tactical point of view because he's committed with his weight quite far forwards inside the baseline and therefore he's vulnerable to a deep or a fast return especially down the middle and that's something you have to prepare for so whilst there's a technical evolution of the serve happening there which is a real positive because it indicates more of a whole body action more leg drive more rotation more racket head speed it comes with the fact that we need a different solution and therefore again if we go back to the ball toss to simulate ball three to feed some balls deep and fast down the middle is a very, very valuable exercise for players because it requires them then to regain their balance, refine their positioning very quickly, and to take a few steps back to get onto or behind the baseline in order to be able to play ball three. So you can do that from a hand feed where you can stay close to your player, or of course you could do it with a live ball feed returning the ball from the far end of the court. But it's a very specific evolution of the serve where a different action requires a different solution and again that has to be practiced that has to be simulated because otherwise players are not prepared for when the ball comes back to them so now i just want to share some ideas with you on what you can do at red and orange and green and um, you being tennis coaches and therefore um, creative people um, you can certainly use your imagination to adapt these drills and to make them fit for purpose for older juniors and for adults in your clubs as well so i'm just going to go through some um, very simple ideas these will also be available in the download that you can get which i'll show you the link for at the end of this presentation so as an overview of the red court so the 36 foot court red dot program um, the key thing is to work on understanding and sequencing and coordination of different actions, okay? Not just with the serve and the return and the third shot, but in general. And play at this age is largely reactive. If you remember those two very young boys who were playing with the football there, um, there was quite a lot of waiting in between each throw of the ball to see what they had to do next. And that's because they just haven't developed the game instinct yet because of their lack of experience. So a lot of it is not planned, a lot of it is very reactive. But the serve is a huge priority. That's another presentation for another day. But the serve really has to be developed well at an early age for players to be able to develop the game at a young stage. So in preparation for the orange court, I would advocate that the serve is prioritised on the red court. That would mean to me that the players should be coming out of the red court programme with a fluid action with the continental grip pretty much in place. So I want you to bear those factors in mind when I suggest some of the activities that we're gonna go through here. So as a coordination exercise, I made the point earlier of how we have to switch very quickly from an overarm action to an underarm action. And simply to get the ball to be thrown alternately, overarm then under, under, underarm with your partner is very valuable in the sense that it's helping them to switch very quickly from the serving action to the action that they're going to use on ball three. Equally, to get them to throw overarm and then underarm, but to different directions. So it could be that the over, overarm throw goes uh, to the blue cone, for example, and then the underarm uh, throw goes to the red cone, which is in the other direction. So not only are they switching from an overarm to an underarm action, 
but there's also a tactical value and a tactical goal. So I'm serving in one direction, overarm, and then I'm throwing underarm ball three in a different direction. Again, we're back to that pattern of play with the serve creating the advantage and then trying to win or finish the point or force the point with the forehand afterwards. And then I would never ever overestimate the importance and the value of just playing three shot rallies. I think it's so important just to get the players to practice three shot rallies. I regularly hear coaches taking great pride in the fact that their little player managed to play a 75, foot, uh, 75 shot rally. And I always doubt whether actually that's a badge of honor or whether actually that indicates missed opportunities because a 75 ball rally is also probably a rally where players have missed opportunities to finish the point. It probably also indicates that the quality is not gonna be so good. And therefore, I would certainly advocate lots of short rallies rather than fewer very long rallies. Tennis doesn't usually contain that many long rallies. Again, go back to the stat right at the beginning. Whereas we know that the serve and the return and to a lesser extent, ball three are pretty much guaranteed in most points. Practice it and make sure that although it's very simple, it becomes a regular part of your practice with players of all ages, whether it's throwing and catching or whether it's hitting the ball, it doesn't matter. Then onto the orange court or the 60 foot court. Again, some simple ideas. First, the overview. By now, the serve should be developing well. It should be a more dynamic action. If you think about Harry and his front foot land, continental grip developing or in place. The players are obviously a little older and they understand simple tactical decisions and concepts. Uh, they should be better at receiving the return and therefore preparing for ball three. And they should be able to evaluate more effectively the opponent's positioning and their strengths and their weaknesses. So it's becoming more planned and it's becoming less reactive. So as some examples, to have the coach, the pro at the far end to return, get the player to serve, the coach returns the ball, and then either stays in that corner, having returned the ball, which leaves a space in the open court, or they fake to recover, in which case the server can then put ball three back behind where the coach has just come from. Again, it's a key play that you see in pro tennis. No reason why that can't start to be developed at an early age with players on the orange court. And it could be done by throwing and catching as well as by hitting the serve and then playing out the point with, with, with rackets. All of these things can pretty much be done by throw and catch activities as well. Similarly, it could be done on the red court and why not explore having ball three as a volley? The volley is probably not at the top of the priority list for you, given the importance of the serve and the ground strokes and the return, of course, but why not for a bit of fun, challenge the kids, even older kids, but to move them down onto a smaller court and then to get them to play a serve and see if they can explore what it means to play ball three as a volley. To introduce serve and volley at a young age is great fun and potentially gives an extra dimension and certainly some new skill sets um, to those players. Look at serving and then alternating easy balls to rally on ball three with tougher balls where they have to find the right tactical response. So they have to make a decision to identify which is a rally ball, which is a ball that they have to attack on, or which is a ball that they're gonna to have to be forced back and they're gonna defend. So make sure that you are constantly challenging the physical and the mental demand for the players in each practice. A practice should always have all four uh, performance factors in it. And too often, as I've made the point several times, the serve becomes an isolated technical activity, which is why a lot of players find it quite difficult and a lot of players find it quite boring. We need to make sure that there is a physical and a mental and a tactical dimension to each practice. Moving on quickly to the green dot court. Um, this is for the slightly older players. Hopefully they progress well through the orange and before that the red court program. So by now we'll have a more dynamic action resulting in the front foot land that you saw with Harry. And that means, as I've already said, that the player is potentially vulnerable to the deeper and faster returns. That means that the players have to be ready to defend as well as being ready to attack. And therefore, simple tactical decisions 
using good receiving skills, understanding your opponent's strengths and weaknesses and their own strengths and weaknesses means that the game has become planned, it's become more expansive and it's become more dynamic. So again, some examples of a few simple practices here. Serve then attack, simple as that. Can the players finish with three? So you could get them, for example, to hand feed the return and then to play attack in mid-court balls or drive volleys. Why not introduce the drive volley at an early age? A little bit like the serve and volley that I mentioned a minute ago. If we start to add in new dimension to players' game, we equip them with the skills to play the game they want to play. So it could be like I showed you in the long video a few moments ago that you hand feed the return and feed them a variety of different balls, balls that they can attack in the mid-court round about shoulder height where they're going to really step up the court and they're going to move around, create space and then play an inside in or an inside out forehand. Give them opportunities to serve and then drive volley. Great fun and an extra dimension to their game. It could be, as I've suggested already, that you feed a live ball on the return. And again, get the players to play mid-court returns, get them to play volleys, get them to play drive volleys. Anything goes with this. But all of this always has a tactical, a technical, a physical and a mental response. And finally, it could be that you get the players to choose between a rally ball on ball three or a drop shot. And just like with the volley and the drive volley, why not start to introduce the drop shot? A lot of players are very poor at moving forwards and backwards. Their vertical movement is usually not as good as their lateral movement left and right. So expose those weaknesses. And if you've got players who can play a simple drop shot, then that's an extra dimension to their game. I'd also add that it's a great activity for helping to develop um, an understanding and a feel of spin and an understanding and feel of the continental grip as well. So again, like the drive volley and the volley, bring in the drop shot as a ball three for some fun. I'm not saying they're gonna do it in every point, in every match, but it is an extra dimension to their game. So we're nearly at the end. And um, what I'd like to do just as a final um, part of this presentation is just to get you to start thinking about what happens next in your coaching. What have you taken from today from the things I've said and the things I've shown you? I'm hoping, as I said at the beginning, that this has been an opportunity for you to reflect on what you do and what you believe, and perhaps whether there are some simple missed opportunities where you could perhaps get a little bit more from the serving practices that you currently do. So I'm hoping that you might write yourself a very simple action plan that you can start to implement in your coaching from today, perhaps around these three thoughts. So first of all, how do you currently teach to serve? Is there anything that you can review from what I've said and what I've shown you that can help you to be more effective in the way that you teach to serve? Secondly. Are there any areas that you can take from today's presentation where your players can improve on ball three? Thirdly, can you challenge your players more in the four performance factors? Serving is not just a technical discipline. It becomes very technical for the reasons that I've explained today, but there is more to serving than just having good technique. It's also about what you do with it, and it's about how you prepare for the return that's going to come back, and it's about how you deal with that physically and mentally as well as technically and tactically. And finally, I'm going to share with you in the next slide um, a couple of links to our website at tennis247.co.uk, where we have free membership and where you will be able to access some of the drills that I've shared with you today, as well as a whole load of other information on different subjects to do with coaching. So I'm inviting you to join. It's a free membership at tennis247.co.uk forward slash join. You can then sign up as a member and you'll be able to access a serve drills resource at the link here in blue on this slide. You'll also be able to access a whole range of interviews with great coaches and people in tennis from around the world. 
and also a whole load of stuff which is going to support the development not just of players but also the understanding of parents and and um, other people that are involved in the game. So I'll invite you to join Tennis 24-7 and be our guest and to download the Serve Drills resource at this link. And finally, I'd like to thank you again to the USPTA for the Florida Division to uh, for the invitation. Um, it's been a pleasure talking to you. I hope you found it useful. I hope you found it interesting. And I hope that you can put together a simple action plan to better equip your players to connect and serve with the rest of the game. By all means, look us up on social media, on Facebook and on Instagram. And uh, if you have any questions, you'll have seen my email address at the beginning of this slideshow as well. Feel free to drop me an email if you have any questions on anything that you think I can help you with. So thank you for your time. Enjoy the rest of the conference and uh, thank you again.